Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dan Pybus, a director in our London transfer pricing team, specializing in financial transactions. Welcome to our episode regarding the cash pooling section of the OECD discussion draft on financial transactions. This forms part of a five part series covering different aspects of the paper. I'm here today with David Ledeur and Michelle van der Breggen, transfer pricing partners in our PwC Belgium and PwC Netherlands offices respectively both specialising in financial transactions. So David, to begin with, perhaps I could ask, how well does the discussion draft outline cash pooling structures? Yeah, well then, the, the discussion drafts start with stating that cash pools are complex, but at the same time it oversimplifies cash pool structure in the actual guidance and, and quite often jumps quickly, fastly to, uh, to conclusions. Now, if you look at the definitions, some are reasonable and some are overly simplistic. Now, the discussion draft defines cash pool activities as pooling of balances as part of short-term liquidity management. So, this is a fairly broad but reasonable definition. And then it makes the difference between physical pooling and notional pooling. When the OECD refers to physical pooling, it assumes that in many cases the netted position is simply one-on-one -on -one deposited to an external bank or lent from an external bank. To me, this seems very exceptional as most cash pools are part of broader treasury management and are as seldom nicely ring fund transactions. So in other words, it does not seem to acknowledge that cash pool structures are increasingly structured as in as banks, ensuring liquidity and funding for group entities on both the short and the long term, use of virtual accounts, and are often embedded with other treasury activities such as payment factories, netting activities, hedging, and so forth. And then on the notional pooling, here the OECD immediately jumps to conclusions by saying that no or little added value is created by the Treasury team. Okay, so that gives us a high level picture, I suppose, as to what the paper covers. But does the OECD also give a description of the functions one might expect a cash pool to be performing? So the OECD provides two examples, which in practice seem to be the two extremes of the spectrum. And it ignores the many variations between those two extremes. So in the first example, the cash pool is an agency function covered by a parental guarantee. Here, the netted amounts are simply left on the master account. Although those setups seem to me rather exceptional, almost all of the guidance of the OECD seem to assume that such a setup is a standard setup. The OECD also mistakenly seems to assume that if a parent provides a guarantee to a bank, the cash pool is risk-free. And here they overlook the fact that the parent will have the right of recourse to the cash pool leader. In other words, it's not risk-free. If you look to the second example, here the cash pool could be labeled as a fully fledged in-house bank. In the example, the cash pool is part of a broader treasury setup with responsibilities for both internal and external financing. It manages and bears all the related risks such as market risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, currency risk. And in this example, the treasury center may, quote unquote, earn all or part of the spread between the borrowing and the lending positions. And although such setups are often observed in practice, the OECD seems to take the assumption they rarely exist. Only two paragraphs co cover such a setup. So if you take a step back, the overall the discussion draft reads as if the OECD feels that cash pools are often used for tax planning purposes. So they overlook that in many cases, cash pools are overly complex business-driven transactions with often uh, some dedicated cash managers. I made to conclude what's also important when assessing the functional profile of a cash pool or withholding taxes. Arguably, if analysis would suggest that the cash pool leader is only a service provider or an agent and should be rewarded accordingly, such analysis may have beneficial ownership and thus withholding tax consequences. So, in my experience, multinationals will have to ensure that the cash pool has a general role and manages risk, which means that most of the multinationals will be in example two and not in example one. Okay, so David, I guess well, you've mentioned there the OECD might consider that cash pools are used for tax planning purposes in some cases. Is it clear to us what BEPS risks are associated with cash pooling arrangements that the OECD are hoping to address through this discussion draft? Yeah, but first of all, the OECD wants to ensure that the cash pool is accurately delineated before the pricing is tested. So this covers, amongst other, the short term versus long term requalification. And a bit in line with what we often observe during field audits, the OECD indicates that if a cash pool reflects the same pattern year after year, it may have to be requalified into a long-term loan. Secondly, the OECD clearly links cash pools with synergy effects. 
a lot of the new guidance lists up the type of synergies and how they could or should be reallocated. And to come back to the examples, it's assumed that most cash pools perform merely Asian type of functions, so not entitled to any of the synergy effects. And finally, the discussion draft addresses the guarantees linked to cash pools. The OECD rightfully observed that cash pools often entail cross guarantees and right of setup between participants. And the OECD hints that very often such cross guarantees may not result in improved credit risk beyond the one stemming from implicit guarantee. And in such case, no separate termination is required. And to me, it seems a shortcut, very much welcome such a shortcut. Because the issue is not only overly complex, at the end of the day, the practical implication may be quite limited. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, David. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to turn to you next. And I guess building on a theme we've already discussed here around the cash pool leader and the return to the cash pool leader, the draft appears to indicate that in certain instances, the cash pool leader might only be entitled to service-based return, for example, for notional pools. What are your thoughts in relation to that? Yeah, fa thanks, Dan. I think this goes back partly to what David has been saying, is that the discussion draft in general seems to look at cash flow structures rather in a simplified way. To me, I would say that the starting point for cash pools is that the cash pool leader is engaged in financial transactions and it starts, is exposed to credit risk, liquidity risk, market risk, etc. So that's clearly not an agency function or a low risk routine type of activity. So for me, starting point would be that you really have to look at pricing the transactions as such and uh, consider that the cash flow leader is exposed to risk. I do agree that especially in certain notional pool structures where the cash pool leader only has kind of an administrative role and, yeah. for instance, communicates with the bank on behalf of the participant, but is not involved in the transactions itself and is also not providing a guarantee, in those instances, it may have a service provider role and should be compensated as such. Um, I think an important remark to make here is also that how you look at the cash flow leader is also very relevant for beneficial ownership purposes and hence withholding tax on interest, like David also said. So a service provider model um, would also suggest that the cash flow leader is not the beneficial owner. And obviously for most multinationals, having a cash flow structure in place, this is clearly something they will have addressed in, you know, how they structured the pool and also how the cash flow leader is set up in terms of financial substance and also operational substance. And in most instances, it will be exposed to risk. And in, in the, those cases, I don't think a service or agency type of approach is correct from an outline principle. And then having said that, if you then also look at some market developments around cash flows, because of Basel III becoming applicable to banks, this requires them to maintain capital against notional structures they offer. So what we see in the market is actually that the number of notional pools is becoming less and less, and more and more clients start implementing physical pools to the extent they have not done so uh, before. So in that sense, I think uh, the service approach will also become less and less what we see in practice, and it will be much more about pricing the actual transactions, looking at the financial risk and substance of the cash flow leader, and compensate it as such. Thanks, Michelle. I guess building on this theme then of the return to the cash pool leader, the draft also seems to provide some suggestions around how the synergy benefits associated with the cash pool should be split between the leader and the participants in the pool. Does that align with an arm's length approach in your opinion? Yeah, I think it does then. Although I would say there are actually two different type of benefits associated to cash pool. And, and I think the, the first one is indeed a benefit that derives from the fact that as a group, to make a cash pool work, you would all need to go to the same bank or a couple of banks offering the pool. And that means that as a group, you have, let's say, uh, economies of scale by which you can, for instance, negotiate better credit rates and debit rates, lower transaction costs, better FX rates. And these are clearly benefits that are created by all participants, whether they would deposit or whether they would borrow. So these, let's say, real synergy effects, you need to clearly demonstrate that all participants are benefiting from that. So, but there's another benefit associated to using a cash pool as well, and that's basically the interest saved 
by using a cash pool. And to me, that's not so much benefit that is a result of a synergy effect, but it's rather that instead of borrowing from a bank and paying to a third party, um, group companies that need cash are now effectively borrowing from participants that have access cash. So there, I would say the external short-term borrowing is basically replaced by internal borrowing. And in that sense, the participants that are depositing and, and basically providing the liquidity to the group companies that are needing cash, they are providing short-term loans, and these should be priced appropriately by looking at credit risk involved, the credit rating of the cash flow leader, et cetera. That is a distinction that's not clearly made in the discussion drafts, or at least it is mentioned in, I think, the third example they apply. But the distinction between synergy effect on the one hand and the interest saved on the other hand as being two different benefits could be made more explicit, if you ask me. Okay, so David, I'm going to turn back to you at this point. In terms of the areas that are likely to be impacted as a result of this discussion draft, if it remains in its current form, what issues do you think that clients might face based on their existing transfer pricing arrangements? Then I expect a lot of disputes on synergy effects. Today, most of the treasury centers, they simply keep the netting effects. While the OECD is hinting that relocation should be the default position. And linked to that, I also expect that tax audits will go in much more detail on what the treasury center is actually doing, instead of simply testing the pricing of the lending and deposit rates. Besides that, I also expect that tax authorities will continue with the short-term and long-term uh, requalification. And quite often, this will lead to double taxation. So, for example, if an inspector in a participant country will apply such a requalification, the tax office in the cash pool location will often be hesitant to give a corresponding adjustment because in most of the cases, there is simply no corresponding structural position on the other side. And finally, I also expect that tax authorities will analyze the group treasury policies to understand the group position on, for example, liquidity management, if and how risks are mitigated and so forth. And then tax authorities might use this as a yardstick to test into company transactions. So it will be key to have consistency between the intercompany pricing policy on the one hand and the treasury information, the annual report, the group treasury policy, the transfer pricing master file and other documents on the other hand. Okay, thank you, David. Michelle, I'm going to come to you for my final question. What do you think clients should be doing now in order to put themselves in the best position going forward with a view to the final draft being released? Yeah, I think that's indeed a good question, Dan. I mean, if you look at the discussion draft, in relation to cash pools, I think it clearly indicates what the areas of focus are according to the OECD and also according to tax authorities. Um, at the same time, it doesn't give clear guidance on uh, how to approach cash pools. So that's one. Two, we do know that cash pools are very often used by multinationals. So it is, I would say, certainly a transaction to address and take care of. Also, because quite often the amounts involved are pretty significant. And also because of what David said, the risk of double taxation is in effect a bit higher than what you would normally see with transactions because it's not easy for a cash flow leader location to make a corresponding adjustment in case one of the other countries would challenge the interest rate or the fact that the loan, for instance, is a long-term transaction. And the other point is, of course, that there is the new master local file documentation setup, which also has a clear focus and a separate chapter on financial transactions. So having this in mind, I would say it's important for, for multinationals to, to basically review their current cash pool setup and compare it to what is now addressed in the discussion draft and to see how it relates to that and at least address topics like synergy effects and the fact that all participants should benefit from that, have a strategy and a policy in terms of how to address long-term positions in the cash pool, and also have a robust approach towards setting debit and credit rates that are applied within the pool, and then document that in a consistent way so that it can also be included in the local files and master files. The other thing that's relevant is to review the operational and financial substance of the cash flow leader. Also, we have an eye on the changes made to uh, Chapter 1 of the OECD guidelines, which are a result of Action Board 8 to 10. So basically, the whole concept about control over risk um, and that you need to have the financial capacity to bear those risks. And finally, I would say in doing such an analysis, it's also important to note that a cash pool is quite often part of a wider treasury setup, 
So it's good to also see how it relates to the other type of treasury tools and techniques that are applied. And finally, to keep an eye on the beneficial ownership and withholding tax on interest side of things, because it all kind of comes together when you look at cash flows. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, David. And also thank you all for your time today. Please look out for the other episodes in this five-part series, which will cover guarantees, captives, interest rate pricing, and delineation.